So these inventories that had gone from about a four months worth of supply in the home market to 12 months worth of supply uh, on, the, on a national basis, you're now starting to see them pull back. You've seen especially out west a big pullback and you're starting to see it in some of the other regions. So it looks like those inventories are working off and that takes some of that pressure out of the home price uh, declines. It takes some of the, uh, uh, puts some of the stimulus back into construction again. So you're starting to see that work through. When you're looking at the manufacturing sectors, what we've seen is a really phenomenal rebound in terms of how quickly uh, this has turned around. You know, we saw those uh, numbers continuing to fall through the end of last year, the beginning of this year. We've now seen those survey indicators that go out and actually talk to businesses. It's a novel concept, I realize. Um, <laughs> how is your business? How are you doing? What are your inventories at? When you look at these sort of indicators, it really has turned phenomenally from March and April. Uh, businesses that were planning for the fact that, you know, consumers would never ever walk through their doors, we're just cutting inventories and cutting inventories. Now, consumers have started to come back and sort of avoided the worst. And many businesses realize, you know, I just don't have enough inventory to meet this. It's not that the, sale, the pace of sales is fantastic, but I wasn't expecting anyone. So you're starting to see that growth move back into businesses. Businesses are reinvesting in inventories uh, and even reinvesting in some growth in certain areas. So you've seen that turnaround come, whether you're looking at the service sector, whether you're looking at the manufacturing sector, uh, and that started to show up in the, uh, the employment numbers. You know, for a while we were seeing these massive declines, 600, 700,000 jobs lost in the U.S. in a single month, month after month after month. The pace of declines is turning there, and it looks like uh, probably by the first quarter of next year, you'll start to see positive job growth in the U.S. again. So, you know, we're starting to kind of get in there. The, the risk here is probably that it peters out at some point, and you see uh, still job declines, but that the, you know, the improvement doesn't continue quite as dramatically as we've seen but you're still seeing a much better picture than you're getting there. That consumer spending is really one of those driving factors still uh, that's kind of driving the, uh, the improvement that we're getting there. You saw the massive declines in the motor vehicle and parts dealers. Uh, we saw a decline even outside of the motor vehicle side. Part of that was the housing sector. You didn't have the knock-on effects getting in there. Part of this was the financing. I mean, if you think of the biggest purchase that someone's gonna buy you know, outside of their home, it tends to be their car. If you couldn't get the financing in the US, that had massive implications getting into the auto industry. So you did see uh, the collapse in the auto sector there at the end of the year, the beginning of this year. Cash for clunkers, all these other things have started to get in there. You're seeing the spending on there. Uh, the fiscal stimulus, the, the, the tax rebates that are going out to consumers, they are getting out there, they are spending somewhat. It's still fairly weak, but there is spending, there is some sort of growth. And that's starting to, uh, to get you through there. The, the, what you're looking at, and in terms of you know where do we go from here, what we saw was a really unprecedented decline and collapse in U.S. wealth. Um, you know we see a 14 trillion or a uh, 14 trillion drop in terms of wealth in the U.S. That's basically the entire wealth of Canada. So basically, all the wealth of all households across Canada was lost over the last year in the U.S. Um, you can think in terms of consumers now thinking towards the future. You know what am I going to do? What am I going to plan? That means a higher savings rate. If you're a household planning for retirement, now you know the nest egg that was there isn't quite as big. So either you scale back your retirement goals or you start saving more to rebuild that nest egg. And so you've seen that savings rate move up in the US. And as that savings rate increases, that's more money going into their savings account, going into their investments, that's less money going to consumer spending. And that's something that's probably gonna be sustained for a little while. So that's another reason to think that even though we're seeing this rebound, even though we're getting back to some sort of positive job growth, uh, what we're seeing, what we're going to see over the next year, two or three, is still gonna be a more sluggish pace of consumer spending than we were used to over the last decade, simply as people continue to sort of repair their household analogies as we move through this. Um, uh, the other area is that fiscal spending doesn't come without its costs. It was a necessary evil to help the US move through these issues and move through these problems but it does leave a very large debt burden and it does leave a, a very big sort of annual fiscal deficit that needs to be filled at some point. And so uh, the U.S. is gonna have to deal with that. Uh, to give you a sense, I mean, something that some of you are probably uh, well aware of, you know, when you're going to refinance your mortgage, you tend to refinance it during a recession because interest rates are so low. Well, it's very easy for the U.S. government to issue debt right now when the Federal Reserve has interest rates at zero. The issue is gonna come as the Federal Reserve starts to raise interest rates, bond yields start to rise, and that's a higher cost for the government to uh, finance their debt. What that means for the government, about 10 years out in the US, is that 
their debt burden is going to be about 5% of GDP just to cover the interest cost on the debt that they're going to be accumulated by then. That means they have to run a surplus of 5% before they even get to that interest cost just to keep the deficit even, just to keep their debt levels even. So there is going to need to be a massive restructuring in the U.S. in terms of figuring out how to get this fiscal balance back in order. Uh, but you know, it was a necessary thing to sort of spend the economy out of the recession, but we are going to have to deal with that as we're moving through. All of this then feeds through into Canada. You know, uh, when you're talking about the Canadian economy, if the question is, with three quarters, we're now you know about 65% of Canadian trade still going down to the United States, it's still going to be a big determinant in terms of uh, how the trends in Canada play out. If you don't have that external demand, it is going to be an issue. Uh, and what we saw, even though Canada didn't have any domestically created problems in terms of this crisis, the banking sector uh, hadn't invested in subprime debt. It wasn't making these crazy mortgages. It didn't, wasn't holding on to these uh, bonds that were backed by 17 parts of 37 different houses that no one knew where they were anymore. So there was, there was this feeling that, you know, all right, so Canada didn't do anything wrong. Sure, there's going to be a bit of a recession because of the U.S. demand. Uh, what we saw was, you know, again, a pretty uh, sizable downturn in terms of the Canadian economy. But across the advanced economies, it was the weakest of the recessions of all of them. So Canada did avoid the brunt of the issues. Uh, it really was a domestic or a, an externally driven recession. A lot of the problems came from outside. The way that they manifested domestically was in the manufacturing side in the production, in the investment side. So you did see it filter through, and obviously consumers took a step back because of everything that was going on. Uh, but what we're seeing now is a bit of improvement. So we saw the contractions basically based manufacturing and the commodities. Those were the two areas biggest hit by the global recession because of the emerging markets taking a step back, uh, because of the massive hit to the auto sector and manufacturing in general. You know, you get the biggest hits into Ontario, BC, uh, Newfoundland, now what you're starting to see is some of the growth move back in. You know, earlier this year, the big question mark was those black bars on the right in terms of growth for 2010. Um, there was lots of concerns that we would still see uh, a number of areas, including Ontario, still in the contraction phase at this point. Uh, it does look like we're starting to see that growth really because we're getting this rebound at the end of the year uh, that seems to be kind of sustaining us through. Uh, so it does look like we're gonna get growth. There's still a big question mark given the fact that we're only in September and my fortune telling skills aren't perfect as to exactly where those numbers end out. Uh, but things are looking better. It does look like we'll get growth. It's just gonna be a question of how much at this point uh, as we're looking ahead. When you're looking at, at, the, at the differences, uh, the domestic demand hit that Canada took was really the external side, as I mentioned. It was really coming through in the trade and the business investment. Uh, what we just had in the second quarter GDP number showed that uh, residential investment, purchases of homes, and consumer spending actually added about one and a half percentage points to the Canadian economy in the second quarter. In spite of that, Canada contracted by a little over 3%. So it was all the other areas, it was the areas that are very sensitive to that external side, whether it's directly exports, whether it's the business investment, uh, that we're still in a bit of rebalancing, still seeing the issues in the second quarter. We're seeing some of that turn, we're seeing the inventories come in. Uh, there's actually signs there's been a massive boost in imports of machinery and equipment into Canada. So it looks like businesses are starting to get back into investing. Uh, which is actually a big surprise in and of itself, uh, just because there's concerns about how much slack there is right now, that the fact that there is a lot of capacity in businesses uh, that's going unmet right now. So uh, that was sort of a, a somewhat of a very happy surprise in terms of the Canadian economy, but uh, it did sort of underscore the fact of what we saw, that domestically the Canadian economy was okay. It was just a question of how bad was this external shock gonna be that was playing through. Um, and that sort of played itself out in the currency. It was probably a bit odd that we had a massive financial crisis centered in the United States, and when that crisis hit, everyone as an investor fled to the United States for safety. Um, old habits die hard, I guess. And, and so we did see that move going back down in the US. As that started to pull out, we've actually seen the Canadian dollar starting to strengthen. Um, and we made a sort of crazy forecast earlier in the year that said that we would actually probably see the Canadian dollar get moved towards parity, and probably just hit parity by the end of this year. And it's looking less and less crazy as we move forward and we get closer and closer back to that parity point. Um, you know, long run, the, uh, the, the, the Canadian exchange rate against the US dollar should probably be around parity. When you look at the relative strengths of Canada, much lower fiscal debts, much more manageable fiscal deficits, uh, still robust, strong domestic side of the economy, the commodity sector, obviously what the world's gonna be buying over the next 10 to 20 years, 